Welcome and a very good evening, lovely student. And all those of you out there who have made time to be with us on this revision show. We are enjoy learning and we are here tonight to talk about genetics. Now are you are aware that in 2016, 17, 18, and in fact 19, and I think I even checked the private paper of 2019, question four, always on genetics. And this will blow your mind. One question came with 18 solid points. In addition to that, from number 40 to 50 of the objective section, count not less than six genetics questions. Tonight, we are going to consolidate about 25 points just on genetics. Stay around. It's been late, but I thank God that you are here with me. It's going to be interesting. Keep listening to me. I'm going to take a break, and when I'm back, I'll zoom into action. You will discover the Mendel in you. Mendel's first law, second law, sex link characteristics. Yeah, I said sex link, but do not rate this with PG or even 17. I'll be back, stay tuned. Welcome back. We want to continue with our revision show. And tonight, we are talking genetics, as I said. Our outline will look at a few terms in genetics. And then I'll discuss the first and second law. And then I'll look at the 2019 question four and then talk about deviations from Mendelian pattern, and then pick the 2017 question for as well, and then we'll end with a few other objective or questions meant to bring out the concept that you have studied. So, I asked a few of um, our students to distinguish between the terms heredity and variation. You see, these are terms that students often confuse themselves with genes and chromosomes, genotype and phenotype. Then we have this issue that some of the books we even have on the market end up confusing the students. Co-dominance and incomplete dominance. Very, 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 very important. And so I'll bring out a few points aimed at letting you understand precisely what each of these will want to discuss. Now, let's take a look at the terms we have here. Genetics is just a branch of biology that deals with heredity and variation. It deals with heredity and variation. Then within that, we will look at heredity as the acquisition of traits, acquisition of traits by offspring from parents through genes. Now, most times students will write offsprings. Now, offspring comes as offspring, whether they are 6,000 or 2,000. So it's just offspring. So the fact that the genes can be passed on from the parent to the offspring is about heredity. Then we have what we call variation. Now, if we are discussing variation, we are looking at the occurrence of differences between traits of individuals of the same species. Emphasis on the same species, as well as differences between traits. Now, when we talk of traits, we can look at height, for instance. Now, if I talk about height, we can have different forms of height. Somebody could be termed as short, another person could be termed as tall. That is to say that when it comes to height, there are two alternatives in this particular scenario. Then we can see that one is short and the other is tall. Then we are discussing variation in height. So if you define variation, restrict yourself 
to a trade and look at the alternatives. We can look at blood grouping, for instance, and say that we have four different blood groupings. Then the trait we are talking about is blood grouping. And the alternatives in there are the A type, the B type, the AB, and the O. Very well. So we have been able to distinguish between heredity and variation. Then let's look at chromosomes and genes. You see, when you pick the nucleus, you will find the structures responsible for the transmission within the nucleus. Those are the chromosomes. Now, when that structure is pushed to the offspring, there are factors on that structure which will actually do the work of prompting that individual to begin to behave or possess some kinds of features. And so, when you pick the chromosome, there are genes lined up on them, okay? Now, the human is said to have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Now, each chromosome has a certain number of genes on them. So, the chromosome becomes the structure in the nucleus that carries the genes. And then the genes are the units of heredity. So the gene becomes the unit. In another context, you see, when we look at the gene as being responsible for a certain characteristic, the gene does that by playing out a certain protein. So we can also define that as a segment of the chromosome that codes for the expression of a particular protein. So note that genes are located on chromosomes. All right. Now, I did say something about character. If I say you have a bad character, it is because I have noticed something in you which I consider as bad. And therefore, if we are talking about stealing, and pardon me for that one, and one of you happens to be a thief, then in that context, the character we are talking about is stealing. It is also possible that the person who has been accused of stealing happens to be a very, very intelligent mathematician. And so, in another breath, if we are talking about the character of mathematics, how to solve the questions, this same individual will also possess that character. And so, your characteristics would include stealing, being a good mathematician, being a good singer, etc. Now, it is these characteristics that we are saying that are coded for by the genes. And these genes are found on the chromosome. So their particular location on the chromosome where we will find the gene is what we call the locus. That is why we say that the locus, the locus is a fixed location, is a fixed location on the strand of DNA where a gene or its allele is found. Very well. So let us look at a few more terminologies. Then we will discuss our questions using these terminologies. The questions will come mentioning these terminologies. And therefore, a good understanding in these terminologies would guarantee a very good mark. Now, when genes are located on the same chromosome, for instance, the gene that brings about the expression of height and then the gene that brings about the expression of skin color could be located on, let's say, chromosome 4. What it means is that those two genes are linked. They are linked. So when we talk of linkage, we are discussing characters which are being coded for by genes located on the same chromosome. Then we have what we call the genome, which is the entirety of the genes that an organism possesses. So when we talk of the genome, it's all that you have. So if I talk of your blood group, and let's say your blood group B, and specifically BO, then what it means is that you have two alleles. Now these alleles are the B allele and the O. 
and the B and O are different forms of what could call for blood grouping. Another person could have blood group A and would have the genes A and O. So essentially, with blood grouping, we'll talk about three possibilities. These are the alternatives. So alleles are defined as alternatives of a gene. And so we will look at the combination, the type of allele combination that an individual possesses. And that is what we call the genotype. The genotype. When I ask for distinction between the genotype and phenotype, at least I had quite a number of students responding positively. Thumbs up for that performance. So the genotype becomes the genetic makeup. What you inherit, what you picked from the chromosomes that would have descended into your system, practically from parents. Then the phenotype becomes what you play out for people to observe. That is what we term as a physical appearance. Now the physical appearance is going to be dictated by what you possess in your gene. So we'll say that the phenotype depends on the genotype. Not that alone, the environment as well. Now let's pick two, let's even identify them as twins. And then we happen to locate one in an area where there's abundance of food. When there's abundance of food, that person can eat and whatever the person has is expressed. Now this partner who is located in an area where there's extreme farming will not be able to feed well and therefore the things that the genes have and can play out will lack the ability for expression. And so you may have these twins coming together one day and one is well built and the other one is in a, a structure that we may find difficult to even describe. Essentially what we are saying is that the two will be coming from the same pool, the genes are the same, but the environment is dictating a different appearance. Very well. I'll talk about homozygosity and heterozygosity. Having discussed genes, gone ahead to mention alleles, okay? For instance, the gene for height, let's assume, is the letter T. They would then go ahead to say that if somebody is tall, that appearance, that phenotype, is as a result of the inheritance of the gene for height, capital T, okay? The other one is a small t. Very well. We would also say that when the individual possesses two of the same letter, if it's capital T and capital T, then that person is homozygous. Homozygous meaning same. Now, if that person possesses a capital T and a small t, then we are talking about heterozygous, different alleles. Okay? Good. The last bit happens to do with what we call the dominant gene and the recessive gene. Now, in Mendel's exercise, and when I talk to Mendel, I get excited. I listen to him a lot. And you're wondering how I did that. Don't worry. Now, Mendel did a lot of practice on plants and then established that for some characters, there are two alleles, a dominant one and a recessive one. What is the basis of this categorization? If Mendel talks about a dominant gene, he's looking at the gene which will mask the appearance of the other. In the classroom setting, when I am there as a teacher, and then I ask you to keep quiet, I expect you to do so. What it means is that my words will supersede your intentions. Therefore, I dominate that gathering. Now, when I leave, then you can express yourself. So to the extent that I am there, I will dominate whatever you do. That is to say that one of the alleles will always suppress the other. That brings up the concept of what? Dominance and recessiveness. Very well. The definitions are on your screens for you to comprehend. Note that as you define dominant gene, we ought to see that one is being masked the expression of one is being suppressed or masked and the other will only show 
if it is present in the homozygous state. So essentially, a recessive gene will appear in the phenotype nature if only they are present as what? Homozygous. Fantastic. The last confusing um, concept that I want to draw our attention to is the idea of homologous chromosomes and sister chromatids effectively displayed on your screen. Homologous chromosomes and sister chromatids. Okay. Now, all of us have 46 chromosomes. And we say we have 23 pairs of these chromosomes. 23 times 2 is 46, isn't it? Good. So, out of that 46, we have 23 pairs. So, chromosome 1 exists in pairs. Chromosome 2, same. Chromosome 3, up to the 23rd chromosome. And note this, you have picked one chromosome from father and one chromosome from mother. So your father gave you chromosome 1, mother gave you chromosome 1. When the two come together, then you have a pair. Then depending on which allele is dominant and which is recessive, you will express one. You understand? Very good. So when we look at homologous chromosomes, we are talking about the pairs that are coming from the parents that would carry same or similar genes. I said same or what? Similar genes. Now, if you look at what we have labeled as homologous chromosomes on the screen, labeled as A, we have at a particular locus, capital gene, and then a small gene. What it means is that there is the dominant gene, capital gene, and then the recessive gene, small gene. They are carrying similar genes. They are not carrying the same gene or the same allele. They are carrying the same gene because you're looking at the gene for gene, but they are carrying different alleles. Okay. Now, when the gene is expressed, we will have the capital gene being expressed. Before the cell divides, the chromosomes will have to double up. That's what we call replication. So you notice that, on the other hand, we have what we call sister chromatids, two of them being red, two of them being blue. The red sister chromatids are actually a duplication of what the other homologous chromosome is having. So sister chromatids are exact copies of one another. Sister chromatids are exact copies of one another. And then, the other side is also another sister chromatin. So, the small g on the blue is repeated over there. Small r, small r. Small s, small s. Big T, big T. So, sister chromatins are essentially the same copies. Now, homologous chromosomes are similar in the sense that they will carry the same genes but could be having different alleles. Now, we have looked at these terminologies and we want to look at what Mendel did. Mendel discussed his exercise by looking at these seven characteristics. So if you consider the characteristics we have here, we can talk about the trait stem length. The alternatives for stem length are tall and dwarf. The alternative for pod shape are inflated and constricted. The alternatives for seed shape are smooth and wrinkled. We can continue with this until we go through all the seven characteristics. So what did Mendel do? Mendel first of all did what we call a monohybrid cross. Now, a monohybrid cross is a cross involving an organism that is looking at a single character of interest. So, if you're looking at height, Mendel chose a tall plant that was true breeding. When I say you are a true Ghanaian, what it means is that left and right, you are a Ghanaian. Your father is a Ghanaian, your mother is a Ghanaian. That's a true Ghanaian. So when Mendel says that a species or an organism is breeding true or a true breed, it means it is homozygous. 
So Mendel selected a true breeding tall plant and a true breeding short plant and then did the crossing. Now, his crossing was such that we had a capital T, a capital T, and then a small T, and then a small T. Now, anytime you have a crossing of this nature, be mindful of the fact that you ought to indicate with the letter X at the center. And I'll tell you why. If you put the capital T's together and the small T's together without the X, there's no crossing at all. There's no crossing whatsoever. It's important that your capital T and small t is separated by the letter X. That is there. There's a cross actually happening. Now, if you find yourself in a room with, with, with your partner and nothing happens, the fact that you are together on the bed or in the room does not mean that there's going to be any fertilization because there's no crossing. So when the cross is not there, you score nothing. You have zero for your effort. Now, going forward, we are going to take the letter T and then circle that another T over here and then circle it once we circle that it becomes a gamete small t circled another small t circled now these are gametes these are gametes so you get a mark for recording correctly the genotype of the parent so you have one mark here for recording the genotype appropriately. You have two marks for recording the gametes appropriately. You have half for this one, you have half for this, you have half a point here, and you have half a point there. So just by doing that, you are scoring the points. Now, let's see what happens when these crossings are taking place. So we have our capital T here, which forms a gamete circled, a capital T here, and then it forms a gamete here, and so we circle that. And then we have our cross, do not forget, a small T here circled, and then a small T here also circled. What do we want to see? Now, in fertilization, we are going to pick this gamete down, and then we'll come and pick this commit also to this point, and then the offspring now comes out as that. We'll do same. In the event that this gamete is fertilized by this gamete, we'll have a capital T and then a small t. We can say the same thing for this gamete being fertilized by this gamete. That's a capital T, small t, and then finally, the last one here, okay, this one also drops down, and then we have another big T, small T. Now, this stage, we call that the F1. So Mendel identified that as the F1, as the F1. So what we have here are the offspring we can term as F1. And you notice that they are all having one dominant allele and a recessive allele. And the term is what? Heterozygote. Heterozygote. Now, Mendel didn't end there. What Mendel did was to look at the second stage of his exercise, which was mating the members of F1. And after mating members of F1, he arrived at a ratio 3 is to 1. So your exercise at home will be to cross this time a capital T and a small t and a capital T and a small t. If you do that, you will end up having one capital T, capital T, two capital T, small t's, and then one small t, small t. So genotypically, we would have three different genotypes. The ratio one is to two is to one. But phenotypically, we'll talk of Three tall organisms and one short organism. Very well. So let's let's look at the second stage of his exercise, and then I'll discuss one of my questions. Now, 
over here, dihybrid crossing, what Mendel did was to pick an organism that differed in two characteristics. For instance, height and color. Height and color. So he chose one that was tall, true breeding, and then a particular color, let's say purple, true breeding. Now, in that case, you are going to have the genes as capital T, capital T, okay, and then capital P, capital P. Now, this is going to cross small t, small t, that's a true breeding short plant, and then a small p, small p, a true breeding what? White plant. So, we are looking at a cross between two parents that differ in two traits. That's what a dihybrid cross is. Now, when you do this one, because it's a revision exercise, I will just say that we will have this capital T, one small t, one capital P, and then one small p. So we have a dihybrid organism here. The dihybrid because it is heterozygous with respect to two genes. The gene for capital, the gene for height capital T, small t, and again, heterozygous for the gene for what? Color, which is capital P, small p. Now, one interesting thing is that Mendel only did that and could not observe what the seeds will have. That brings us to another confusing concept, what we call the test cross and the back cross. In the test cross, Good. In the test cross, we are testing for the genotype of the organism. Okay? So, for instance, you have noticed a very tall gentleman, and because you are a short lady, you desire to have very tall children. And so you decide to marry this tall gentleman. So what happens? If your first child is short, people will wonder, is it true that this guy, tall gentleman, is the father of your child? It is possible that that gentleman in question is not having a capital T and a capital T, but a capital T and a small t. Do you understand? And so the, the, the sperm that got fertilized happened to be what? The one kind of small t. So you may have to, of course, it is not going to be acceptable in our culture, in humans, but Mendel was able to pick other plants to cross them so that he could distinguish between tall plants that were homozygous tall and tall plants that were heterozygous tall. So if you cross a homozygous recessive, all right, or a recessive, obviously it's going to be homozygous, with a tall plant whose genotype is not known, that's a test cross. You are crossing the unknown genotype, which of course is a dominant phenotype. Because if it is going to be a recessive phenotype, then the genotype is already known. So it's a dominant phenotype, but I want to be sure it's homozygous tall or heterozygous tall. That's how we are crossing that with what? A recessive. That's a test cross. Now, in simple terms, when that test cross involves one of the parents, okay, then that kind of test cross is termed as what? A back cross. Are you with me? We have members of F1, for instance, and we are saying that we had big T, small T, big T, small T, two of that, big T, big T, and then small T, small T. For us to pick out which of the big T's are homozygous, and heterozygous, we ought to cross that and we may decide to use the homozygous recessive of the parental that becomes a back cross. Now, when Mendel did that, he established some laws which we are calling the principle of dominance. That is one principle that he established. Then the principle of segregation and the principle of independent assortment. These are very, very key 
and you should be able to memorize them extensively. On any day, you can be asked to reproduce that and be sure that you can quote that verbatim. That is why I've left them on the screen for your consumption. Now, having given that preamble, let's go on to look at one question which appeared just last year, 2019. A man, heterozygous, so we will underline heterozygous, a man, heterozygous, for dark skin color. And we are using the letter D to mean the gene for skin color. And we're saying that the dark skin color is dominant. That's how come we're using capital D. It's married to a homozygous light-skinned woman. The light-skinned woman is also being depicted with the letters small d. Okay? Now, there are four children. That's good. With the aid of a genetic diagram, each. Okay? With the aid of a genetic diagram, each. Determine the number of children that will be light-skinned. So the terms heterozygous has appeared in the question, homozygous has appeared in the question. And this gave us a whooping 18 marks. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That full question carries what? 20 marks. And this question of genetics alone, 18 marks. Let's see what that means. I, I, dark skinned, if a light skinned child was married to a spouse who has the same genes for skin color as a father. So we are going to do a genetic cross, and that genetic cross is aimed at determining the number of children that will be light skinned, number one, and then I, I, that will be dark skinned. Take note, I am going to take a break. Now that I have given you this question, I will take a break and then I'll allow you to ponder over it. When I come back, I will discuss that question and note that you ought to have the letter X in your crossing. No, take note that you ought to circle your gamut. Because when we come back, I'll try and find out what you did and then I'll tell you what you have scored. Thank you. Stay around. I will be back. Welcome back, welcome back. I'm happy you stayed around. Now, our next thing to do at this point is to discuss the question I gave out. I'll quickly go through once again. A man, heterozygous for dark skin color, D, is married to a homozygous light-skinned woman, small d, and they have four children. With the aid of a genetic diagram each, determine the number of children that will be light-skinned. Now, if we take a look at this question, the genotype of the parents have been given. And we have a certain expectation, which is light-skinned. Now, you can see on your screens that we have a homozygous light-skinned woman small d small d and then a heterozygous dark skinned man capital d small d then we have their gamut circled always circle the gametes good what next at this point we are going to do the crossing so what i have here is that this capital d is going to be fertilized by this small d and then the kind of offspring we shall have will have the genotype capital D small d. Now if this gamete is fertilized by this other gamete, we will have 
a capital D and again a small d. And then we will have this gamete fertilizing that gamete giving us a small d and a small d. And then finally this with that another small d small d. So these are the offspring. What's the phenotype of this? That capital D small d. From the question, you notice that capital D is dominant. What it means is that anywhere you have capital D, that individual will show what a capital D would provide. That's dark skin. So here we have dark skin. Now, the small d small d will be light skinned we have gone through our crossing so the question is telling us to determine the number of offspring that will be what light skinned so we have two being light skinned end of story let's go back to the question and see if our answer tallies with what we are supposed to be doing a question says that determine the number of children that will be light skinned. Okay. Now, at this point, let's go through what we have done and establish the marking. For being able to determine that the parents have this genotype, you have a point here and then the point there. That gives us two points already. Good. Then you have these gametes coming from these parents. Once the gametes are circled, you are going to score. So you have half a point here, half a point here, half a point here, half a point here. That gives us two. Then again, we have what you call correct crossing. Correct crossing. Once you have fertilized appropriately, you have your lines coming from one gamete, meeting the one from the other gamete, that is correct crossing. You have one mark for that. Then you have your offspring here. And these offspring are also going to fetch us marks. Half for this, half for that, half for this, and half for that, giving us two points. So just by doing this, we have been able to accrue seven solid points. Then we have our conclusion also here. Once we have been able to determine that we're going to have two having light skinned, we have an additional point, giving us eight. Now, you notice that the question gave us the phenotype of the man and the phenotype of the woman. So, let us come back and establish that we have parental phenotypes which are heterozygous dark and then homozygous light skinned that will also fetch us a mark. So this comes to the total of nine points. That comes to the total of nine points. The other bit of the question will also give us nine points. And I am going to leave that for you to complete. Now on your screen, you can notice that we have a heterozygous dark skinned spouse and a homozygous light skinned child, which practically looks like what we had earlier on. Now, when you have a situation like that, stick to what the question says, don't think the question is wrong, go ahead and answer it. That also turns out with another nine points. So, 18 solid points accounted for. A capital D and a small d. Let's go back to the question. Now, 
with the aid of a genetic diagram, determine the number of children that would be dark skinned. If a light skinned child, that is small d, small d, was married to a spouse who has the same genes of skin color as the father, and the father was heterozygous d, capital D, small d, and then we're asked to determine the number that would be dark skinned. So you realize that our crossing will end up looking like what we have done for I. So that repetition will give us nine other points, 18 points. The question on vestigial structures are not questions that you should find difficult to handle. I'll continue with the crossing and then we shall talk about vestigial structures later. I believe that you are following what we have said so far. At the appropriate time, I would allow you to send us your questions and then we will answer them. Now, let's go and look at the next question that was from 2017. From 2017, we had a question that also captured something similar. Now, that 2017 question dealt with a deviation from Mendel's law. And here we have 16 points from just that question. That is how come I wanted to spend time understanding how to answer questions in genetics. Then we'll be able to score these marks comfortably. Once again, I would go through the question and I expect you to think about it, start something, I will take a break. When I come back, then we shall prosecute that 16 marks that YX is ready to dole out. What is the question saying? Ladies and gentlemen, a child belongs to blood group O and the mother belongs to group B. With the aid of genetic cross, state the possible blood groups of the father. I'll come back and it has to make sense and it will make sense. You will discover the Mendel in you. Stay around. I'll be back.